Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the DC3 conference from cryptocurrencies to CBDCs. In this fireside chat, we'll explore whether digital currencies can take financial inclusion to the next level. My name is Stephanie Lelora, and I'm here with Mr. Bishoy Dasgupta. Please, Bishoy, come to uh, switch on your camera. Is the chief economist at eCurrency. I'm with Mrs. Fatima Fanny Sadeh. She's a crypto lawyer at General uh, Geneva Legal dot, uh, CH. Um, Mr. Chris Ostrovsky is the global head of uh, public sector engagement at CELO. Um, Mr. Xiao Sheng Sang, principal manager at Amazon AWS. And we'll see a pre recorded video from Mrs. Catherine White. Uh, she's an Accenture Fellow at the World Economic Forum. Welcome to you all. As you might know, according to the World Bank, there are still about 1.7 billion adults worldwide who do not have access to financial services. However, we now have the technology to create digital currencies that, are, that can offer low cost, safe and real time payments, removing some of the main bar barriers uh, to financial inclusion. Suddenly for the first time, they excluded the vulnerable, the invisible, have the choice to access to financial services that they could never dream of. Although surely in a quite unstable and unpredictable environment yet due to the high volatility, volatility sorry, of cryptocurrencies. Yet the changes here and the governments and financial institutions are embracing it. So the objectives of this session are to consider first, what are the advantages, the challenges, and the risks that the various type of digital currencies could pose for financial inclusion? And uh, secondly, what can governments do to address them? So Bijoy, are you ready? Uh, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, good evening to all of you. I'm ready. Thanks, Stephanie, for that kind introduction. Uh, this is Bijar Dasgupta from uh, based in Washington, D.C. with the e currency. And uh, I'm going to talk, you know, my uh, opening remarks are really from the work uh, which uh, we've been doing at the ITU's uh, Digital Currency Global Initiative, the Policy and Governance Working Group of which I'm a vice chair. And let's talk about some of the policy uh, principles which are needed for financial inclusion, which is uh, what we've come up uh, in the group. So really there are eight of them. The first one, uh, uh, digital currencies must be interoperable as, as otherwise financial inclusion cannot be achieved if consumers, businesses, governments, all of us really, cannot engage in peer-to-peer -peer transactions across different systems. This is the first key pillar. Uh, the second one, of course, is that digital currency should operate through competitive and open networks to reduce costs and, and uh, uh, increase uh, 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 accessibility for all. Uh, third, the third pillar, of course, is they must be secure as otherwise cyber attacks and other breaches can undermine trust. Because at the end of the day, you know, trust is at the very heart of uh, what uh, digital currencies are all about. Uh, the fourth pillar is, is, is uh, you know, effective regulation and supervision. We heard a little bit about governance yesterday in the cross-border uh, CBDC panel, and this is really, really very important uh, uh, to ensure safety, soundness, stability, and we talk about investor protection, consumer protection, data protection, very much so. Next slide, please. Uh, so if we come to the, uh, the second set uh, of policy principles, and again, there are four of them, uh, the, the, the fifth one is about access. And, and this, is, this is really very, very important. We, we must have universal access. Uh, and uh, in conjunction with that, policy efforts should aim to close the digital divide as much as possible. 
Uh, the next uh, pillar which uh, the working group uh, talked about and, and ar arrived at as part of their deliberations is again to talk to mitigate the risk of exclusion. And here, both uh, financial intermediaries and governments uh, should aim to advance digital financial literacy programs. You know, very often we take this as a given, we, we are the world, we are here in, you know, kind of uh, year four, year five in the digital age, 2022. But again, I think uh, that uh, uh, in, in our deliberations, it was clear that the financial literacy is still lagging in many parts of the world, even in advanced economies like the US. Uh, the next uh, pillar which uh, we, we've identified is a, a national digital identity system would be helpful for facilitating adoption. Now, this could be through biometric means or other innovations. You know, there is the Aadhaar program in India, which is a biometric program, and there are other programs around the world. But uh, I, I think the bottom line is, uh, to the extent possible, uh, we should be using the, the digital identity systems for, for adoption. Uh, last but not least, uh, in terms of pillars, is a centralized data registry could also be helpful for facilitating adoption. And here we've got to balance data sharing with safeguarding privacy for the public good. And we'll come to that uh, later on uh, in the course of, of this hour. And, and uh, for data sharing, the, the basic issue is that the banks, usually banking systems to collateral-based lending, whereas the promise of FinTech and non-banks is we can move to non-collateral-based lending uh, using some of our uh, behavioral data analytics, which come from when we use uh, uh, digital currencies for payments uh, uh, and, and use our track record there. Uh, next slide, uh, please. So these are the eight uh, sort of uh, key pillars. And I just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, uh, um, the Bank of Jamaica, the governor you heard from yesterday um, and their CBDC project uh, which is uh, it uses a bare instrument for retail CBDC uh, uh, development. Uh, financial inclusion is a key driver there. And, and we, we are designing and, and implementing that project to achieve uh, both financial inclusion and some of the other policy objectives of the project. And the use cases, are, okay, just two minutes. And uh, the use cases are both bank and non-bank CBDC wallets. Stop, thanks for that, thanks, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Bijoy, very interesting. So now, uh, Fatima, are you ready? Yes, thank you for giving me the floor and thank you for inviting me to this fireside chat. Um, so I'm gonna delve right away into the topic. You mentioned that, uh, Stephanie, 1.7 billion people are deemed to be unbanked and more of that are also considered to be um, what we call underbanked. So meaning that they lack an account at a financial institution or mobile money provider. Um, so the key here is in our discussion is about healthy financial inclusion because I mean, obviously we can connect them to the financial system, but it shouldn't lead to any negative kind of uh, consequences for them, such as being over indebted and so on. And um, in that context, and healthy financial inclusion would mean that individuals and businesses have access to useful and affordable financial products and services that meet their needs, it being transactional payments, savings, credit, which is an important one, and insurance which are all delivered to them in a responsible and sustainable way. So I took this definition from um, a World Bank report. So definitely this is a very humble goal to pursue when phrased uh, in, in such a way, um, but there are the barriers to financial inclusion. So um, our dear colleague Bijoy mentioned some of them um, in, in, the, in the pillars, uh, but um, usually they are categorized into, into three broad categories being social, cultural, demographic barriers. So people distrust the current financial system. There's literacy issues, safety issues. Uh, we can even think of religious, social, and cultural ones. Infrastructural barriers, lack of reliable internet connection, um, electricity, 
uh, other form of um, requirements for connectivity, mobile phones, um, ID as well, um, and so on, and then financial barriers. So for instance, the cost of the financial service are just too high. Um, so these are the more traditional barriers discussed. There is another category that for me is maybe the main barrier to financial inclusion, which is um, regulation. So there is so much regulatory hurdle, at least in the jurisdictions I'm familiar with it being Switzerland, the European Union, or uh, even the United States, um, which makes FinTech innovation very slow and costly. And therefore, the private sector is, just has a way harder time to bring this innovation to, um, to people and then uh, also um, get, gain more financial inclusion within that uh, country or jurisdiction. Um, therefore, I don't think necessarily that retail CBDC is the key to financial inclusion. However, uh, better regulatory environment, better sandboxes, easier access for um, just fintech innovations would be key for this financial inclusion, it being through the integration of CBDCs or stable coins or any other form of cryptocurrency or, or else. Um, nonetheless, it's worth not noting here that um, CBDCs have a form of regulatory advantage uh, over the other private fintech innovations or private sector just because uh, it comes from central banks and from financial authorities that have an easier access to, um, to the regulatory needs, um, to, 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 to see their regulatory needs met in order for um, CBDCs to be integrated and adopted uh, by most of the population. So therefore, it will be a big uh, drive for the financial inclusion uh, in my opinion, here it is. I hope it was within the five minutes. <laughs> Perfect, Fatima. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. Very interesting. So now, uh, Chris, it's your you're on stage now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Stephanie and Bijoy, for your presentations. Yes, my name's Chris Ostrowski. I'm the uh, Global Head of Public Sector Engagement at C Labs, which is the software company that serves the Cello blockchain. I'll explain what the Cello blockchain is in a minute. Um, I previously worked for OMFIF, which is a central bank think tank in London, and there I set up the Digital Monetary Institute, which was a place where all central banks um, shared their thoughts and their fears on CBDCs, cryptocurrencies, and the, I suppose, sharp and accelerating changes that have occurred in the past two years. I mean, I certainly saw a big difference myself in, in that environment from the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018, where digital currencies were not taken particularly seriously by central banks, to the point at the beginning of 2020, where there was a real hunger and thirst for more information. And we're at the point now where most central banks have made some sort of statement about CBDCs, many have um, some sort of proof of, of concept or pilots going, and more have various research um, uh, departments and uh, research projects where they're looking at how a CBDC might help them in, in, in their country. So this is a fascinating time to be talking about uh, digital currencies, about central bank digital currencies and stable coins. And certainly in emerging market countries, one of the main policy objectives that is often articulated by central banks is financial inclusion. And when I started working for Cello in September, the thing that I certainly noticed was that financial inclusion is one of those things which uh, pretty much everyone is in favour of. You, you seldom, if ever, hear a, a politician, never hear a politician or a central banker say they're against financial inclusion. So I think we all agree that this is something that is, that is good, that if it can be achieved, it is a worthy aim that can improve people's lives. Um, I did have the, a similar definition to Fasma because she's already read it out. I won't repeat what she said. But the idea of being able to access financial products that are sustainable and useful, including payment, payment savings, credits and insurance, is something which um, we can agree um, is what financial inclusion is. And as Fatima said, simply creating a CBDC doesn't necessarily drive financial inclusion. 
Um, there are different types of, of central bank digital currencies. The, 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 the Chinese have issued a very interesting um, CBDC in the last few days. It's still a pilot, which is to be um, uh, mainly tested at the Winter Olympics. But the actual um, ECNY CBDC app that you can see on your phone, you can see very clear videos of how it works, is a, quite a, a step forward. Um, but does it drive financial inclusion? Um, it's difficult to see when you look at what the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the CBDC app that the Chinese uh, central bank have issued. Um, it's difficult to say that that on its own drives financial inclusion. It's certainly very impressive and it, the way it links to your bank account, the way it gives people um, sort of spending limit options and those sorts of things will certainly make the user experience better if the project's a success. But it's hard to say that it drives financial inclusion. At Cello, what we are trying to do is um, create a situation where everyone and anyone with a mobile phone has access to any form of currency that they wish. And this obviously means that um, for people who have never had a bank account and never used mobile money before, we're talking about a form of financial inclusion that, gen that really does, is, is a marked change in people's lives. So if you are someone who has only used cash and uses cash for 90% of your transactions uh, day to day, then getting all of those transactions into a digital environment where you use it on your phone is only really possible if the technology exists to allow safe and secure transactions on a mobile phone. Uh, Celo uses the, um, uh, the, the, the blockchain technology and the unique thing about Celo's technology is that it is mobile first. So it is the only blockchain which is entirely mobile native. So all the apps are built on a mobile phone. Anyone who wishes to add to the blockchain and build new products and services can do so. So if I can just paint the picture to you where um, you can have a CBDC or a stable coin which is accessible on any mobile phone. You don't need a laptop or a private or public key like you do for normal cryptocurrency. You simply have it on your, on your phone. You can use that to transact with anyone else um, in, in, in your own country or elsewhere for very low or almost minimal uh, charges. You can buy and sell things with this app either remotely or in your immediate vicinity. And you also have access to the type of products that are simply never going to be available if you have cash. You have access to credit ratings because your payments can be recorded over previous weeks and months. You might have access to a micro insurance product that would never be possible to be developed because of how de-risking occurs with big financial institutions. And you might also have access to um, the, 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 the sorts of sort of, you know, cashing out and um, uh, uh, credit policies and micro insurance that would 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 simply not be possible with the with, with the current system. And in some ways, I'm this so is curious, uh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. So, so th th that's that's the vision of what uh, Celo subscribes to, creating the condi conditions of prosperity by driving financial inclusion. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you. So, no, Sao Shen, are you here? Yes. Welcome. So, thank you very much uh, uh, for this this uh, invitation, and uh, I have enjoyed. Uh, the discussion yesterday and also today. And uh, my name is Xiao Jun Jiang, and I'm with uh, AWS. And you probably wonder, you know, why AWS uh, is interested in in this topic, and also, you know, what we can just uh, potentially help uh, in in this discussion. And uh, I'm in the federal financial team, and our team have uh, helped financial regulators uh, to address the different challenge that's. Uh, they may face, and uh, you know, central bank digital currency is definitely one of them. And uh, interest, uh, of course, that's. Uh, I don't want to claim, uh, or I think you know, from the many of the central bank uh, uh, related conversation, that even no central banks uh, will claim that uh, um, CBDC is uh, you know a panacea for financial inclusion. And it is really, you know, as a policy objective with, which has been raised by many central banks, that it has the potential to just really address, you know, financial inclusion in a different uh, way and then becoming a new tool or even a, a potentially a, a effective tool in addressing the challenge. And I can build my um, uh, conversation uh, with with what have been shared by you know speakers earlier that's you know uh 
for financial inclusion that it's really we, we need to first talk about the financial exclusion and the, you know why people are excluded from the you know financial system so here that you can see you know some of uh, our categorization that uh, some are you know uh, accessing to unsuitable financial services and uh, then they you know uh, some basically because of this unsuitability self excluded from the system like there are cost related trust related or need based obstacles for um, you know um, individual citizens to to embracing the financial services then there's also you know another category no access to any financial service at all and that is you know related to the atm local bank is too far there's you know different challenges that you know earlier speaker are already just uh, talked about so here that's you know how to just help central banks to make if you know financial exclusion is a policy goal for their CBDC project and how can they design to make you know CBDC address financial inclusion and also you know how to just later implement a CBDC uh, and which really deliver the result so here that's uh, you know there are a couple of uh, Things that uh, we 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 com communicated with our central bank customers in the way that uh, you know uh, it, we call it as inclusive CBDC framework ICF, and uh, there are a number of uh, components which are important. Number one is you know policy and not alignment. So if uh, financial e inclusion is really a policy objective, and that has to be really you know included from the beginning of the design of the research of also you know the the different uh, um, options uh, which need to be really included at a policy level to align the cbdc uh, whole design with the you know financial inclusion as a policy objective and if uh, you know address those barriers mentioned by by the you know uh, speakers earlier if there's uh, you know uh, economic concern if it is a trust concern and how can you know the design reflect that concern design for the purpose the second piece of the pillar is really you know serving both the formal and informal economy so many of the financial exclusion is because you know many of the citizens are are you know um operating in the informal economy and how can CBDC be leveraged to really supporting not only the formal economy but also the informal e economy and I think that's also is extremely important. The, the third piece is protecting data privacy and data security. If uh, you know a, a system which doesn't provide uh, privacy and uh, that you know doesn't provide that confidence that this will be provide them you know a, a, a security system their data could be you know tampered or that uh, potentially that will also jeopardize the adoption and how you know to design in the way to really protect data privacy uh, privacy and the data security and uh, uh, another piece is uh, you know training and education when a central bank chooses a cbdc solution you have also you know made the decision on how much and on what uh, training and education will be needed for your uh, staff for intermediaries and also for citizens and uh, oh, how can you do that, that sorry we need to wrap up sure last the two pillar you know number one is enable innovation and uh, how to enable other service provider to design service the last piece is the hardware and the offline solution where that's you know definitely need to address the technology and the infrastructure related challenge and make sure that uh, this is a tool which is available for all thank you thank you very much Xin. now we are going to to watch a video from Catherine white Hi everyone, I'm Catherine White, an Accenture Fellow at the World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution based in San Francisco. I'm, I'm happy to be here at the DC3 conference in this discussion about financial inclusion. In my fellowship work at the forum, I co-lead the Digital Currency Governance Consortium or DCGC, which is a global community of digital currency experts, which was launched in the spring of 2020. 
DCGC is comprised of 85 member organizations across 33 countries around the world. In November of 2021, we published an eight part white paper series compendium report. Of those white papers was an in-depth study of stable coins for financial inclusion, as well as a look at whether blockchain based digital currencies might help make cross border aid disbursement more effective and efficient. I had the pleasure of leading our research for the exploration of blockchain for cross border aid disbursement. To begin, we acknowledge that the biggest challenges facing cross-border aid disbursement are in fact human process and geopolitical challenges, which technology alone cannot remedy. However, many organizations are piloting whether blockchain-based solutions can bring more effectiveness and efficiency to aid disbursement. So we interviewed over a dozen global humanitarian aid organizations such as the Danish Red Cross, Mercy Corps, Oxfam, UNICEF, World Food Program, Cash Learning Partnership, as well as the major multilateral development banks and key stablecoin operators. Across all the pilots conducted, the top three benefits cited for using blockchain for cross-border aid disbursement were an increased visibility and transparency for funds transfer, um, increased access to banking for the recipients, and cost efficiency of the payment transfer was reported across many of these pilots. Um, however, there were many challenges cited through the pilot projects and the top three among these across all of the ones we interviewed were a potential to increase the digital divide, um, data protection for the end users, and an uncertainty and lack of regulation in the locales. We noted also that serious ethical questions and nuances arise regarding the testing of emerging technologies on people who may be caught up in crisis or find themselves in a vulnerable state, as there are considerable risks to tracking targeted groups of people. However, vulnerable populations also risk being left behind as technology advances. So given the current momentum and volume of pilot projects, it's likely that cross-border aid disbursement will continue to include and even increase the use of blockchain-based digital aid in years to come. In a recent episode of Coindesk Money Reimagined podcast, members of DCGC discussed how the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated mobile use for aid disbursement. For example, the field workers at the humanitarian organizations had to go remote and rely completely on mobile deployment. It was also raised in this episode, um, the point about the private sector being crucial for advancement of humanitarian aid innovation, because the international organizations have the offices and outposts where aid is needed, and they know what modalities to use for the people in those communities but the private sector has prowess in the deployment of the technology, which can be best done by them. So we have to rely on each other's core strengths of each sector to advance financial inclusion and innovation. I invite you to read the DCGC's compendium report and listen to the Money Reimagined podcast following the link shared here. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful discussion today. Thank you all. So now we'll enter uh, our Q&A session. So for, for the audience, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A section and our panelists will try and answer to you. So. This, this session is, is very interesting and, uh, and to me it's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to moderate since I've been working in, in Latin America to, to implement uh, the blockchain technology for financial inclusion and I'm pretty aware of all the limitations that you face where uh, the, the, the technic technological solutions is not enough as was mentioned in, in, in all over the, this panel. And uh, I think we could uh, maybe sum up uh, the most common barriers of financial ex exclusion. Maybe Sao Shen, you want to 
to sum up what was said in the in the different panels and your view on it sure thank you yeah for the question and uh, i think you know uh, our earlier panel already just uh, you know referred to this and there are a lot of uh, different categorization but uh, you know if we just uh, um, uh, bring different perspective together and then there are really you know four type of barriers uh, or three type barrier as others already mentioned you know from the economic barriers we are looking at uh, financial exclusion caused by lack of access to formal economy or fi formal services many of the underserved population works in a shadow economy that is often cash based and the second barrier is in you know, a culture barriers Financial exclusion is often caused by self-exclusion due to traditions or simple lack of trust in financial sector and uh, market barriers. And uh, then, you know, exclusion caused by lack of competition, which fails to provide incentives to uh, service uh, the underserved. The underserved are not traditionally a profit market segment, which limit the type of entities willing to serve them. And the last but not least, uh, technological barrier and uh, a lot of exclusion caused by lack of infrastructure or access to modern technology and access to you know consistent electricity internet technological devices is often you know lacking uh, among underserved population so you know however many of the underserved are now familiar with mobile technology as you know uh, access has increased dramatically but even when you have uh, you know CBDC, which uh, are mobile based, and then there's uh, still access to mobile devices. And I think uh, those are you know, the, the categorizations uh, which we use, yeah. Thank you very much. So before we go to the specifics on how CBDCs would actually uh, lift financial inclusion, and maybe Chris, uh, could you, I have this question for you. How will financial inclusion will be judged as a success? How will we measure the success? I think um, you have to look at people having more power over their lives in a really kind of um, uh, clear and obvious way. It has to be um, measurable and it has to be clear. I think um, simply using um, currency on a device um, doesn't necessarily make it more inclusive. It's also what can you do? What are you allowed to do if you have... Um, the opportunity to use currency on a mobile phone. Yes, to make it accessible, it has to be as easy as making a phone call. You do rely on a mobile device in someone's hand. You do rely on electricity. You do rely on some sort of coverage. Though the way the cello blockchain is designed, it's not necessarily designed for a smartphone. It could be a cheap mobile phone that you get in the market that just has SMS messaging. So if, you've, if it's as easy to send an SMS message, if it's as easy to make a phone call, and then it gives you access to pay for things on credit monthly, it gives you the opportunity to save and to um, borrow in a way that cash doesn't, then you have um, moved the needle on financial inclusion. And in a way more important than all of that, the, we're, we're, as we discussed Web3, I mean, we, the, the, the best examples that we heard there from Catherine in her video was, was you know, aid, aid disbursement. The cello blockchain is mainly used at the moment to dispense aid. So Oxfam, the UN World Food Programme, the World Bank, Care International, they use the cello blockchain to deliver cash benefit payments directly to people. And there are all the issues that, that Catherine rightly raised that, that, that need caution. But that gives the opportunity for people to have access and financial empowerment in a way that they didn't previously. So if a CBDC offers that, offers those changes that are not allowed for people um, who currently don't have access to a bank account, don't have access to cash, then we can judge it to be a success in terms of financial inclusion. Thank you, Chris. I really like uh, the way you say it. It should be as easy to transact as to send a, an SMS on a mobile phone. Thank you very much. So now, Bisho, I have this question for you. Could you elaborate on how CBDCs would, in practice, help lift financial inclusion in your vision? Uh, thanks, Stephanie, for that question. A great discussion so far. So at the end of the day, what is a CBDC? CBDC is an instrument, it's a digital instrument, just like cash, which can be used across all payment rails. It's a 
it's a liability of of the sovereign government or the central bank. It is absolutely safe. It is not a big tech. It is not a stable coin or a, a cryptocurrency. It is a liability of the state. It's a safe, secure device which can be uh, instrument which can be used across all devices: mobile phones, smartphones. Uh, the old fashioned phones and, and they can be linked to bank accounts, they can be linked to e-money and all of that stuff. So at the end of the day, what are we trying to do or what are countries trying to do? They're trying to provide a safe, secure instrument which is easily accessible uh, across all payment rails. Uh, and and it's, it's uh, uh, fast, it's instant settlement, it's cheap. Now let's uh, come back to how would it operate in practice. Let me give an example. Let me look at Jamaica or Indonesia for that matter. Half the population is non-banked. Everybody has a mobile phone. Actually, more than the mobile phone penetration is over 100%, right? Now, what you're trying to do is the bank-led financial inclusion is not working. And neither is the e-money-led financial inclusion. And I won't even get to stable coins because there are issues uh, 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 related to the, uh, the uh, issuer and the liability of, of the, the big tech company supporting it. So what uh, CBDC does, it, it provides the instrument. And, and that instrument, since it can operate across all payment rails, it's a safe and secure instrument. And, and you and I can you know, send money to each other. And, and by using that instrument, we are building up a payments history. And that data that we are generating, both banks and non-banks can use to, uh, you know, to roll out a lot of other uh, products, financial products, formal financial products, be it a credit product, uh, 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 a saving product, an insurance product. So it opens up that entire landscape in a secure, safe, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, and fast settlement way, right? And that's the beauty of CBDC. It allows the instrument. See, I'm sure we've talked about, you know, we've there are a lot of barriers and technology and all of that stuff. But that instrument is the is the beauty, and then it. It's a public-private partnership where the public sector rolls out the instrument, the private sector innovates and leverages on top of that. Thank you, Bishoy. You're surely enthusiastic about, about this. It's, it's very uh, nice. Absolutely. I mean, yes. And why are central banks taking a little time to roll it out? Because they are thinking about all the uh, sort of uh, uh, the cons and they're designing it correctly to take into account some of these things we have to uh, sort of watch out for. Oh, thank you, Bijo. That's perfect for the next question I have for Xiao Shen. Uh, Xiao Shen, how can central banks just uh, plan, design and architect uh, this inclusive CBDC and realize the potential of CBDCs for all? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And I see a lot of questions actually are also around that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one particular, you know, area that uh, we focus is on this inclusive CBDC design principle. And I share the, you know, just within the in the policy alignment with, uh, you know, serving both formal and informal sector, protecting data privacy, data security, and provide training and education, enabling innovation, and also hardware and offline solution. In general, those are the key, you know, component or pillars that central banks, uh, you know, need to address. If, uh, you know, financial inclusion is, uh, you know, one policy goal that's, uh, or if, if it's the, the desired outcome they are looking for, and uh, again, that you know, go back to 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 the ex exclusion or the hypothesis. You know, what happens, uh, um, and which prevent uh, you know um, citizen to to just uh, enjoy or benefit from the financial service. Then the CBDC really you know tap into that. And some of the questions uh, in 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 the discussion. Uh, it, uh, or about you know in in the um, environment or in a country which uh, there's a technology barrier, there's a, you know KYC related barrier, and then those are exactly the type of you know uh, barriers where you know you for central bank when design this and then how to just uh, leverage uh, existing technology infrastructure, make the the CBDC available twenty four seven, 
and how to just scale up or scale down the system to make sure that the cost you know related concerns can be addressed and how to just you know using different type of uh, API and, and the solutions to make sure that, uh, you know, the, 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 the privacy and the data is being protected and also the system is, uh, you know, secure. So all those uh, really can be really addressed by you know, the choice of technologies and also the service that the system is leveraging. And we are working with many central banks on that, yeah. Thank you, Sarshan. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to uh, to you, Fatima, with uh, a question. But first, um, you know, I'm. Uh, it's very it's very nice to, to to listen to you all, and and we're all turning around the fact that uh, okay, everybody wants financial inclusion. Okay, so uh, yes, but sometimes in the way of our good at in intentions, you know, we are missing the point. No, because we're still having one. But seven billion people out of the system. So the, the the very blockchain industry starts with Bitcoin and with this dream of financial inclusion. Uh, many many Bitcoiners are fanatics about uh, financial inclusion and the revolution blockchain uh, brings to 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 this uh, particular issue. So. Fatima, um, in your opinion, is the broader fi decentralized finance uh, space concerned about financial inclusion or still concerned about financial inclusion? Um, thank you for this question. Um, I, I, I do believe so. Um, and you're right uh, for um, I mean, financial inclusion or the narrative of banking, the unbanked, uh, which is not necessarily um, a narrative um, that, that, that is good to be promoted anymore in the way it was before, but it's still very prevalent in the, at least within um, the decentralized uh, cryptocurrency space, it being Bitcoin or Ethereum mainly. Um, let me just add a point here to the entire discussion we had so far. Um, so our perspective seems to be very um, micro or country by country. So we see financial inclusion as whether or not someone is connected to the financial system of uh, the place it resides, for instance, or with very limited cross-border applications of remittances and so on. Um, this number of 1.7 billion, I would put in perspective uh, with um being connected or included within the more global financial system that we have today. And I think this is where cryptocurrency brings a lot of innovation because one can just plug into this like global financial system uh, where you can borrow cryptocurrency, lend, you can um, do a lot of, I mean, I have access to a lot of financial products in a decentralized way, which means in a permissionless way. So you, no one has to authorize you to, to be able to access that system. While um, if we look at um, just jurisdictions and how the legacy financial system works today, countries can be entirely excluded from the SWIFT network or from uh, being just connected to the global financial system. And this is a huge um, financial exclusionary event that should not be underestimated. So it is very important that we focus on micro inclusion, but it's also uh, as important that we focus on macro inclusion um, in that sense. If I can just... Um, at another point, so I saw someone ask a question about KYC um, in, in the chat. And, and that's where I think that the decentralized finance space does um, care and focus uh, for financial inclusion, where um, the way the um, decentralized finance um, products are, are um, created or designed, it means that it's either peer to peer or peer to protocol or to smart contracts. So um, you never have to interact with one centralized entity and therefore um, they do not necessarily need the same regulatory approvals or licenses that um, the just legacy fintech sector would need to be able to provide um, these products. And because of this, then you uh, do not have to go through any KYC AML, for instance, um, checks where um, for instance, you would be just, or your country of residence would be excluded as a blanket exclusion from, um, from this, uh, this product without any kind of uh, underlying 
valid justification as to your person. I'm Thank happy you. to discuss more about this. This is uh, this is this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, but uh, actually, um, I have another question for you. Maybe to uh, to complement what you said before, what do you think the uh, CBDC uh, builders can learn from the latest developments in the crypto ecosystems, like from uh, DAOs, from DeFi, from NFTs, etc. Um, I think there's a lot to learn and uh, one, usually some people say uh, that CBDCs themselves are highly inspired by what happens in the cryptocurrency um, um, in industry, let's say. Um, so now that also stable coins are, are, are very important and a big, big part of the cryptocurrency space, um, CBDCs have to come in also for um, the native currency to remain relevant in, in this highly technological era that, that we're going through. So I think um, one, one thing that I would love to see, and I think it, it, could, be, it could be interesting, is for um, CBDCs to see how they can um, be compatible with other, for instance, uh, for with NFT marketplaces, which is uh, quite trendy right now, or just for, with decentralized finance, um, financial products, um, also, um, with regards to decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, how, with the help of CBDC, one can uh, imagine new forms of uh, companies or organizations that would be built uh, in a similar manner that the AOs are built um, and created, uh, coordinated on, on the blockchain. I think there's a lot um, to get inspired from. And also, um, it would be interesting to just monitor what's happening in um, the decentralized space to see where uh, the focus of the market is and what people um, are using and need. For instance, we see in countries where um, CBDCs, where there would be a need for financial inclusion, um, but the native currency is uh, very volatile or is uh, going through hyperinflation, for instance, people yeah. do um, adopt stable coins or cryptocurrencies in a way to hedge um, their risk against that, that native uh, currency. So, for instance, their CBDCs will ne not necessarily lead to a more healthier financial uh, inclusion or system, um, but then it will be interesting for these regulators or central banks to look into um, stable coins or other form of um, digital currency integration uh, within the decentralized space. Yes, thank you very much, Fatma. Uh, this is uh, exactly one of the points we're having to face in, in Argentina, for example, with uh, very high inflation rates and uh, our adapters are very attracted by stable coins and the possibility to, to save money, save money, and to also to, to try and get uh, micro insurance uh, uh, services also. Thank you very much. Bishoy, I'm going back to you with this question. Do you know two potential concerns about CBDCs are disintermediating the banking system and undermining privacy, privacy? Sorry, Are these real concerns and can they be taken care of with the right CBDC design and architecture? Uh, thanks, uh, Stephanie, for that question. Uh, yes, uh, these are concerns. And that's why uh, uh, the CBDC designs are, are being, uh, architecture and designs are being done to take care of it. So we at the currency are implementing a CBDC in, in Jamaica and, and, and will soon be with many other central banks around the world. So the, uh, the disintermediation concern is pretty much straightforward. You put in transaction limits, uh, you put in holding limits. Uh, but of course, there is the bigger issue that uh, 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 you know, banks at the end of the day don't need on uh, need deposits to grow their credit. At the end of the day, they need capital, and they also need uh, uh, access to uh, uh, wholesale markets for funding. So yes, CBDCs can increase the cost of uh, funding for banks a little bit, but with transaction limits and uh, holding limits, uh, that uh, is a mitigant. Uh, second thing on privacy, it is it is very very important. Uh, privacy is at the heart of the matter in terms of a CBDC system. So that's why the way we are designing. The, the, the system at a currency is it's a bearer, current, a bearer token instrument where you de-link the identity 
of uh, the holder of that token from what the central bank can see in terms of transactions. So that's why it's a public private partnership where the, uh, the central bank can see the transactions, but not who is doing the transactions. Let me just come back to one issue on stable coins and cryptocurrencies. You know, stable coins and cryptocurrencies have a lot of downside risk. And, and when I hear people say that AML, KYC, you know, you can do it without that, it makes regulators and policymakers around the world very nervous. Uh, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, you can undermine the global financial systems, you can undermine uh, monetary stability, sovereign stability, monetary policy and economy, uh, and, you know, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, undermine all kinds of checks and balances. So all of these things have a lot of downside risks and, and clearly regulators, and that's why I want to go back to the eight pillars that we put out under the uh, uh, ITU's DCGI initiative. And if you see all of them, it's very clearly designed uh, and effective uh, supervision is, is a key part of that story. Thank you very much, Bishoy. So uh, Chris, um, I'm back to you. Uh, I'd like you to tell me what, in your opinion, what's the tipping point that will lead to mass adoption of digital currencies? I think um, ease of use and benefits um, which outweigh the current system will continue to become more and more obvious. I mean, the examples that uh, we heard from uh, Fatima there would answer the, the, the question for this panel is, can digital currencies take financial inclusion to the next level? And the answer to that is, for some people, it already has. I mean, certainly in some places where um, there were big barriers to remittances, um, various people offered cryptocurrency solutions that let people transfer the same value for um, uh, for, by avoiding the barriers. And, and there are certainly a couple of examples in, in, in Africa where um, a new form of remittance simply allow people to bypass the systems. They didn't use their banks, they didn't need to use Western Union anymore, and that worked. Um, it's always kind of a bit uh, sort of stop and start. You know, one country bans crypto um, uh, exchanges and then another country allows them and that sort of thing. But right now, there are examples of where people who have been excluded from the financial system have been able to do what they wanted to do through digital currencies. But that's not really the sort of thing, I don't really think that's the um, that's the exact point of the question here. We're talking here about when will it become something that's normal enough, safe enough, and regular enough for people to, for, 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 for it to change people's lives, for it to move, for, for it to move the needle. The technology already exists. If you can send a, a photo on WhatsApp to any of us, and we're all in different parts of the world here, it does, it is possible to send, um, uh, to, to, to send five dollars as well. It's absolutely possible to do that. Um, I think for central banks, um, they are, are eager to make sure that privately issued currencies don't become the norm in a way that um, threatens the, the, the current model. And, and it's, it's right to do that. So if you think about it from a central bank's point of view, they haven't had their business model threatened for 350 years. And now, for the first time it is and this is a big deal this isn't this isn't a small deal so the best solution from my point of view and, and cello unlike most actors in the crypto sphere are big supporters of public money and big supporters of central banks and the the, the guarantees that they can provide um success would look like it being easy enough and for uh, people to use it and that means it, it being e as easy as using a cryptocurrency instead. So if you are locked out of the system for whatever reason, for political reasons, or um, because uh, there, are, there are barriers to entry, and you're thinking about using Bitcoin, if a CBDC existed that allowed you to do that, that would be the tipping point where you think, okay, um, now we've moved the needle away from cash and away from the system where there are barriers to entry to where it's used more widely. So the ease of use is the main tipping point for financial um, inclusion, for, for the adoption of digital currencies. When the ease of use is there in terms of devices, in terms of safety, in terms of public money being protected, and that does include some of the KYC and identity issues that BJ was talking about, then I think we will have reached the tipping point. Thank you, Chris. And to, to wrap up, maybe to conclude at least, I think, on, on, as a personal opinion that uh, trust uh, in the in CBDCs will also 
be part of uh, of this of this tipping point no and uh, i was very interested by uh, xiao shen uh, uh, what by what xiao shen said that there are two different kind of uh, financial inclusion exclusion one is uh, self exclusion and uh, i really like to hear uh, that and i thought a lot of, about it in the last weeks and i thought oh yes definitely the governments have to seduce <laughs> the, the population to adopt this new technology and convince that they really want to use it for financial inclusion and that it's really going going to change the the the, the unfair uh, uh, the unfairness of of uh, the actual system for uh, part of the population and the in, uh, inadaptability to to their needs so uh, a lot of challenges for uh, for uh, central banks for governments but also i'd like uh, to to remind what I think um, I, I don't remember who said it, but anyone one of you said that uh, all the actors must must uh, participate. We we can't expect financial inclusion if governments are not uh, working on, on on the subject. If uh, private companies, if uh, financial institutions are not ready to collaborate. And so um, uh, hopefully uh, this, uh, this new, I mean, this new technology has brought us to think a lot and to move a lot and to change our paradigm. So welcome. And uh, thank you very much to all. It was a very interesting panel. I'm very glad to uh, have shared it with you. Um, so now uh, we'll just uh, switch to the next, uh, session. So, um, okay. So, we have. Uh, okay, sorry. So there are there will be two more sessions today for the stable coins track. Sorry. So the next session session will be at two p.m. Uh, CET on uh, challenges and opportunities for stable coins. Uh, it will be followed by the session on implementing inter interoperability for stable coins at four p.m. CET. So we hope you will join us for this upcoming sessions and I wish all uh, you all a very nice day and thank you again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Gifty?